Hi there, my name is Tammy Vanderwell from the University of British Columbia here in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, and I'm pleased today to be talking to you about movies two ways uh, and some novel uses for movie fMRI in studying child psychiatric disorders. So to start, in my lab, uh, we use movies for a number of different purposes, oftentimes more than one at, at a time. So we use them to decrease noise, very important in developmental neuroimaging, uh, to increase our signal of interest, and what I'm going to be talking about mostly today is this idea about using movie watching as a brain state. But to start, we'll look a little bit at how we do this uh, with regards to decreasing signal to noise. So, uh, a study led by an undergraduate student in my lab, Simon Fru, recently used Healthy Brain Network data, a big sample of kids ages 4 to 22, uh, to look at specifically at head motion from movie to rest. We already knew that movies help decrease head motion, particularly in younger kids, but we didn't really know how. Uh, so what Simon showed, in addition to a bunch of other things, uh, is the, what the temporal dynamics look like of this effect on head motion. So here on the x-axis, we just have our scan session progressing. On the y-axis, we have a measure of head motion, and the red squiggly line that we're going to keep an eye on is the mean head motion of our high movers uh, or our troublemaker kids. And what you see is that even within a five minute resting state run, you have this temporal drift. You have an increase in head motion even within each of these subsequent five minute runs. What's interesting is that when you add a movie run, you don't have that. So the head motion stays pretty much at its normal baseline. There is no temporal drift, even though this is a 10 minute run and even though it's happening later on in the scan. It certainly looks like you could just keep scanning with these kids uh, and their head motion would stay about the same as long as you're giving them a good engaging movie to watch. Let's move on and just briefly talk about where my lab basically started, which is this very intentional effort to craft movies on purpose uh, to either evoke or avoid ev evoking specific time types of processing. So this is imagery from our first movie, Inscapes, which was released as an open science tool in 2015. Basically, this movie was meant to approximate resting state for kids and other people who have difficulty staying still. So we're avoiding social processing, we're avoiding language, right? So that's what this seven minute film was about. This one, little unsung hero here, this one's called When Hyder Met Simmel. It's also seven minutes. And we're using these very simple geometric shapes to tell a very complex story and narrative that goes on for the full seven minutes. So this one is part of the narratives database. Uh, if you have questions, just shoot me an email. This last one I'm gonna show you is called All Day Wrong. This is our first live action movie. And it's 10 minutes of symptom provocation. Uh, where we're basically showing these different scenes and content and music that we think will evoke symptoms in individuals with OCD. So this is where we're talking about using movies to drive signal in the brain, and we're doing it in a very task-based kind of way. A different way of using movie watching is to not care so much about what the brain is seeing, but to make sure that the brain is seeing a lot uh, and then to treat it as sort of a brain state. So you'll see what I mean by that. This first study that I'm going to show you was based on the seminal paper by Mark Lees et al. in 2016, uh, the big gradient paper, right? So this showed that underlying all of the complexity and richness in a functional connectivity matrix are these organizational principles. The interesting thing here is that these principles are interpretable uh, and very robust across species, across different scanners, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The famous gradient is this one, which is the principal gradient. And this is of note hierarchical, meaning that it is anchored on one end by heteromodal cortex, very clearly a data-driven default network emerges here. The other end of this gradient is anchored by these two poles, both of which are sensory primary sensory cortex. So that's why this is a hierarchical gradient. When we saw these data, we immediately thought, what would the organizational principles look like 
if each of these brain regions from all parts of this gradient were actually engaged and active in processing, right? Basically, what would these organizational principles look like during movie watching? So Ahmad Samara is a doctoral student in my lab, and he took this on using Human Connectome Project 7 Tesla data, which conveniently scanned on two days with these very nice long movie watching runs and resting state runs. Important to remember what the participants are watching. So they are watching a whole bunch of different movies, right? Each run is made up of multiple clips. We have some that are independent films, some that are Hollywood. Uh, but the idea of using movie watching as a brain state is that you can do this. You can throw all of this information at the brain, average the stuff at the end of it, and that this is a useful and meaningful way of studying brain organization. So Ahmad took uh, great care to create these very pristine and densely sampled FC matrices. We applied the diffusion embedding pipeline and came up with the standard resting state gradients. So this is great. We've replicated it along with everyone else, uh, but at least we know our pipeline is working. So when we do look at movie, what do we see? Well, the first gradient looks quite similar. This is recognizable as the principal gradient, but there's some very interesting differences. The one I'll point out to you now is that the, during movie watching, the heteromodal pole of this first gradient is very much equally occupied by both frontal parietal and default network. The second gradient, very obviously a visual to non-visual gradient. The third gradient also modality specific with a focus on these auditory and language regions. Uh, and this is sort of our current favorite gradient. And that's because it's very unique in the movie watching. You don't see a version of this in the resting state data. So there's a lot of different things that Ahmad did. You can look at the reliability of these movie gradients. You can see how much data you need to get good reliability uh, and all sorts of th different things. So you can check out his paper in the journal, which must not be named uh, from this year. As a child psychiatrist, when I see these new movie gradients uh, and the fact that they are all hierarchical, but I now have this nice granular sensory specific uh, structure, right? I now have a three-pronged attack that I can use to try to understand brain organization in different disorders. But first, we would want to know what's going on in development. We hypothesize that the top two gradients, sensory, motor, and visual, would be about the same throughout childhood. But we wondered if this one, if the auditory language movie gradient, wouldn't show us some interesting age-based differences. So currently, Ahmad is working now again with the Healthy Brain Network data. Uh, we're concatenating across two movie runs to get enough data to look at gradients. And we have a nice age distribution here that we've divided into three cohorts. Uh, one of kids ages five to 10, adolescents 10 to 15, older adolescents 15 and above. We see the variance explained. One thing we usually do when we first get gradients outputted is to just do this straight correlation across the gradients. So here we're going from gradient one to gradient four um, and across children, adolescents, and older adolescents. For gradients one and two, everyone's gradients look pretty similar. When we get to gradients three and four, we see that something interesting is going on and it looks like maybe What's happening in the movie gradients is the same thing that was observed in resting state gradients in kids, that there's an order switch happening in the gradients. So we aligned all of our gradients to the adult gradients that I showed you before. And when we do that, we resolve this issue. So it's not really that there are like entirely novel gradients emerging, which you might have surmised from this, but really it's that the, one of the age groups has a different order. And so indeed, when we look, that's what we see. So first off, the first gradient, recognizable, very similar to what we saw in adults and similar from children across. Same thing for the visual gradient. Things get a little bit interesting when we're looking at the third and fourth gradients. So here's that order switch. So in the younger kids, their auditory gradient was in fourth place. And then for everyone else from then on, it's in third place. Is that significant? I'll show you a little more on that in a second. 
There's also topographical changes happening here. This is a very simple gradient going from auditory regions to everything else. As you go up in these age groups, we see some differences and things start to get a little bit more complex. Some of these sort of higher order regions get uh, coalesce into that gradient pole. So there's both topographic and variance level changes happening here. So is this variance change interesting or meaningful? We looked and are looking more obviously um, at sex-based differences in the sample, very important, and sex by age. What you see here is that at this sort of inflection point around eight, nine, 10 years of age, the amount of variance being explained in females is greater than that by males. And that aligns with what we know about maturational indices in the brain. Typically, the females are gonna, are gonna reach uh, maturity first. So that's possibly what's happening there. We can look at this variance thing a different way by just focusing in on the auditory language gradient. And you can see that though there's small gains in variance, they do look, at least here, like this is significantly different from kids to adolescents and from kids to older adolescents. So we're unpacking that a little bit more as we speak. We now have these three gradients. We have interesting observations about this gradient in particular in development. And the thought is that if different regions have to make a jump on a gradient, that that would represent an element of risk or a, an expensive process, perhaps, uh, that we could look at more. Obviously, we're also very interested in these things in psychiatric disorders. So right now, we are working on relating the gradient scores in all of these gradients, movie gradients, to uh, depression subscale scores in those same data I just showed you. Uh, we also have some pilot funding to look at these in developmental coordination disorder uh, and are working with Gaurav Patel's group in, at Columbia University to look at movie gradients in schizophrenia. So more hopefully soon. Moving on to another way of using movie watching um, as a brain state. This is work spearheaded by Hallie Shearer in my lab, who is a master's student. Uh, in a, her prior lab, she focused on TMS, and specifically TMS for treatment of refractory depression. So a lot of interest right now in our field trying to improve the efficacy of this treatment. And one way of trying to do that is to use individualized targets such that we define or identify a target in an individual patient and can literally target the TMS to that target wherever it might be in that specific patient. As laid out by Katerina Gratton et al., uh, if we want to start using FC-based data for precision psychiatric efforts, we need to have better reliability, we need sensitivity to individual differences, and we have to optimize our data quality and quantity. Halley's observation is that there's a lot of data already showing that movie fMRI does these very things. Problem is, is that these are all whole brain studies, or at least network level studies. These are very small regions. Uh, and we know that especially reliability and individual differences uh, are heterogeneous throughout the brain. So they have regional variation. So Halley's question was, uh, what if we look at these in very specific ROIs that are relevant to psychiatry? So she picked three ROIs, DLPFC for depression, pre-SMA, uh, relevant to OCD, actually a target for OCD uh, with TMS, and TBJ uh, of interest in schizophrenia. So those are her regions of interest. Her measures of interest are here. She has both univariate and multivariate measures of reliability, standard ICCs, I do see two, um, and then sort of this mix of individual differences uh, and reliability, which is discriminability and fingerprinting as sort of a proxy. So also using HCP data, uh, so this is healthy adults. So if we look at all the measures from all of the regions, what we see is that in the DLPFC, movie and rest basically perform equally well. And for these two measures, discriminability and fingerprinting, both are performing at ceiling. So that's kind of interesting. This is a not massive patch of cortex, and you can do this very, very, very well. Moving on to pre-SMA, we have a small advantage maybe for movie and fingerprinting. And TPJ, 
movies winning in three out of the four measures. What I will point out here is that rest did not win in any case. And that to me is especially interesting given the fact that we're talking largely about reliability. So we measure it and we get the same answer twice, right? But here I'm, my test and my retest are two totally different sets of movies. So what would happen to those measures if I showed the same movie twice? What would happen if that movie were disorder specific, right? Starts to be potentially interesting, especially when what we're trying to solve is an optimization problem. So to close, we talked briefly about efforts to use movies in child psychiatric research to decrease noise. I primarily talked about head motion, uh, but we're working on this functional alignment idea. Signal to noise, where we use movies very intentionally to drive certain kinds of processes. And I showed you the movies that we're using to do that. Um, and then we mostly talked about using movie watching as a brain state, both for grade analysis and as an acquisition state for future precision psychiatric research. So I will close by thanking my lab, uh, my multiple very fun collaborators, uh, and of course, the very important funding agencies. If you have any questions, my email is right here on the screen, and I would be happy to chat more. Uh, but otherwise, hopefully we'll maybe see you in Montreal. Thanks for watching.